All right. Uh, today I was thinking of going through something a little bit different, uh, namely colloquium three topics from biochemistry, and that includes lipids and proteins that could be anywhere from cholesterol synthesis, bed oxidation calculations, uh, lipid synthesis, including fatty acids, tags, how lipoproteins work, etc. Uh, but huge, huge disclaimer, and I cannot preface this enough. Uh, uh, this is in no way supposed to replace lectures or seminar tasks or even homeworks. Anything that you should go through before the colloquium, you probably should go through. Uh, again, this is not replacing. I'm not a professor, so... Um, I just want to say that uh, in, if I say something wrong or if I, you know, go absolutely nuts in some of these uh, descriptions of the pathways, if I accidentally say something that is completely not scientifically accurate, um, I apologize. Uh, I am not a professor and this is just how I am currently studying for my own uh, attempt for the colloquium. So if you guys want to experience that, if you want to understand maybe calculations a little bit better, um, you're welcome to watch. All right, let's start this off with lipoproteins and apolipoproteins. First of all, uh, some good news. We don't have to talk about the intermediate uh, uh, dense lipoprotein. I think it's called God. I forgot, but I think that's what it's called. The only things, uh, the only lipoproteins we need to remember are chylomicrons, very low density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, as well as high density lipoproteins, and these all are included in uh, three pathways in total. The first pathway is the exogenous pathway, which are which include chylomicrons right here. The second pathway is the endogenous pathway, which either goes back into the liver right here like this, or it continues further into the peripher peripheral tissues right there. Then finally, we have the reverse, um, sorry, reversed cholesterol transport, which is this right here, which involves uh, cholesterol transport via HDL lipoproteins. Uh, but let's go through each of them one by one. First of all, chylomicrons. They are the most dense uh, and biggest uh, lipoproteins out of the four that we're going to talk about. They contain mostly tags, as you see here, like majority just tags, and very few apolipoproteins, very few cholesterols, as well as very few phospholipids. Uh, these are pretty much what you get from a dietary lipid. So as soon as you eat something, eat fats, etc., uh, the dietary lipids are going to go through, and this is important here, the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system are going to transport the chylomicrons, and they are going to be broken down by an enzyme called uh, lipoprotein lipase, so very easy to remember. Lipase, of course, breaks down lipids and lipoprotein is just the name of the type of lipids. So they are going to be broken down into fatty acids first, as well as chylomicron remnants. Now, fatty acids can, uh, with the help of, uh, uh, oh God, I think it's called albumin, can just travel um, into the blood system, no problem, while chylomicron remnants always have to go back into the liver for continuation of uh, maybe cholesterol synthesis, for example, uh, or VLDL for the most part, because they mostly contain tags, as I said. This is what we call the exogenous pathway, meaning that it comes from the outside. Well, in this, in this context, it comes from the lymphatic system and it goes back into the, or not back, it, it goes into the, the liver. Uh, for chylomicrons, we have three important apolipoproteins, all right? It's ApoB48, which is very unique to chylomicrons. Uh, they actually, 
I think this is supposed to say chylomicrons and not cholesterol. Excuse me. <laughs> so they're actually supposed to... Uh, uh, sorry. The apolipoproteins are proteins that help with either receptors or other forms of functions that can uh, help with the continuation of the metabolism of these lipid proteins. So for apolipoprotein B48, it's very unique to chylomicrons, so it will not we will not see this for the other lipoproteins. And it's used in order to transport as well as clear the chylomicrons from the lymphatic system. As for the next uh, apolipoprotein, it's apolipoprotein C2. It activates the lipoprotein lipase, which we can see right here. And that is, of course, important in order to break down the chylomicrons into remnants so that it can go in further into the liver. As for uh, liver entrance, we need some sort of apolipoprotein here as well in order for the chylomicrons to actually be able to go through the liver membrane, which is, of course, apolipoprotein E. This is going to be universal for almost every apolipoprotein in order for them to enter the liver. Now next up we have the very low density lipoprotein uh, and of course this is the least dense lipoprotein of them all. It contains the most tags uh, or mostly tags uh, and then a little bit we see we start to see the cholesterol esters right here and free cholesterols. Uh, I think it's supposed to see, say cholesterol esters, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, the pathways it's included in is actually two. It's both the endogenous, which is this one right up here. We can see that it goes from being very low density lipoproteins to intermediate to low density lipoproteins. Now this low density lipoprotein can go to uh, one of two ways. Either it goes back into the liver or it goes into the peripheral tissues, and this is where it get, gets breaking down into cholesterols. So that is the endogenous pathway. Then we have the reversed cholesterol um, transport. Uh, and in here, we actually use HDL as a sort of uh, cholesterol um, shuttle, you could say, that almost acts like a vacuum. So it vacuums up all of the excess cholesterol we have and then a very low density lipoprotein comes in in order to pick up that those cholesterols and bring it back into the liver. Um, yeah, and then we have the apolipoproteins for very low density lipoproteins. And I think the this is the most we have for lipoproteins. So it's apolipoprotein B100, which is the one that binds to the LDL receptor. And it is very important for, of course, a later on when the VLDL gets transformed or bro broken down into low density lipoprotein in order for it to go back into the liver or even the peripher peripheral tissues. Uh, then we have apolipoprotein apolipoprotein B, wow, that's a mouthful, 48, which is, again, maybe it's supposed to say cholesterol. Huh. No. <laughs> this isn't supposed to exist there. That one's just unique for chylomicrons. See, I always make mistakes when I'm supposed to film, but it doesn't matter. Nobody noticed, right? <laughs> so apolipoprotein B100. Uh, of course, apolipoprotein B48 is unique for chylomicrons. So you will only see them for chylomicrons. You won't see them for very low density lipoproteins. Now, apolipoprotein C1 is a little bit tricky. I tried to look up in the lecture uh, about the function of C1. Couldn't really find one, um, so I just looked it up, and it's supposed to be protective, and it could also inhibit uh, lipoprotein 
lipase so maybe it, it is some sort of regulatory apolipoprotein i can't really say about it but this uh, appeared in the seminar tasks as an important uh, apolipoprotein for a vldl so I'm, I'm including it anyways as for apolipoprotein c2 this one is a little bit more detailed it actually activates the lipoprotein lipase so anything you see here as well as here. So of course you, you will see it for chylomicrons because chylomicrons need to be broken down by LPL as well as VLDL right here. Uh, and then we have apolipoprotein E of course, and that is for entrance into the liver right here. There we go. All right, next up is low density lipoproteins. And here we are starting to see majority cholesterol esters and free cholesterols. So this is where we get most of our cholesterol from. Uh, so for pathways, it's only an endogenous as we can see in this scheme right here. The LDL we, uh, is Part of the endogenous pathway where it either either enters back into the liver or back into the peripheral tissues and for this one it's actually very very important to note that it only uh, has one apolipoprotein and that is apolipoprotein b100 which binds to the ldl receptor so remember that uh, both chylomicrons, VLDL, and then later we're going to talk about HDL, have apolipoprotein E in order to enter the liver. For uh, LDL instead, it has this special apolipoprotein B100, which binds to the LDL receptor right here and right here. And that is the only apolipoprotein that is included for LDL. HDL, as I said, is the little cholesterol vacuum right here for reverse cholesterol transport. And it's produced both by the liver as well as the intestines. It contains mostly apolipoproteins. Um, and as we said, it picks up cholesterol from cells and returns to the, ri li uh, to the river, to the liver. Uh, the only pathways it's included in is the reverse cholesterol transport right here and uh, the two ap most important apolipoproteins now when i talk about the apolipoproteins for each of these i'm only talking about the most important they of course include more apolipoproteins than this uh, with the exception of ldl which only has apolipoprotein b100 uh, however these are the most important ones that uh, our professor went through during the seminar task so for HDL, it would be apolipoprotein, ooh, apolipoprotein A1, which activates LCAT. And what does LCAT stand for, you're wondering? Let me just look up all my notes so I'm not mispronouncing anything. Whoop. LCT helps nascent HDL, which is newly formed HDL, to mature, pretty much. And it is also a ATP dependent LCAT stands for lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase and again it helps a uh, newly formed HDL to mature into uh, what we know as mature HDL. Later on CETP which is a cholesterol ester transfer protein helps transfer the cholesterols or cholesterol esters from the HDL that the HDL has picked up like a vacuum back to VLDL so that the VLDL can go back into the liver. Uh, however, we only have really one apolipoprotein that, ooh, where is it? There we go. We only really have one apolipoprotein for uh, the... Uh, enzymes that I just mentioned, which is for the LCAT. For the CTP, CETP, we don't have any apolipoproteins that are um, dedicated for that enzyme specifically. Then, of course, we have apolipoprotein E, 
which is about entrance into the liver, which uh, most of these lipoproteins have, as I uh, mentioned before, except for LDL, which has the special apolipoprotein B100. Another important thing about the HDL, it doesn't have any apolipoprotein B groups. Now for more fun stuff, the cholesterol synthesis. Uh, let me just scroll down into my notes. Cholesterol synthesis is pretty much occurs almost or nearly everywhere in the liver or per peripheral tissues. Remember that when we have the LDL, which is rich in the cholesterol esters right here, and cholesterol free cho cholesterols too, uh, goes back into the liver or it goes back into the peripheral tissues. So when we have cholesterol synthesis, this is pretty much what is occurring. Um, or actually, no, we don't start with LDL. But anyways, when we want to synthesize new cholesterol, when we, for example, don't have a lot of LDL, we use cholest this cholesterol synthesis pathway. And this is used, of course, mainly in the liver or the peripheral tissues in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum primarily. Uh, but it could also be seen in the cytosol and liver. Why did I repeat liver there again? All right. Uh, for the start of the cholesterol synthesis, we, of course, start with acetyl-CoA. So a common thing we're going to see with, with lipid synthesis, because, of course, cholesterol is a type of lipid, is that it always... The, the basic brick or building block for these um, lipids are always going to be acetyl-CoA. And what is interesting is that acetyl-CoA actually gives us so much energy when it goes in, into the citric acid cycle. So when we synthesize these lipids, we are giving up an immense amount of ATP, an immense amount of energy in order to synthesize these lipids. So what we have instead is, for example, some overflow or uh, an accumulation of ATP where we really aren't in, or the body isn't in need of ATP. So instead of using the acetyl-CoA to uh, get more ATP, we're using the acetyl-CoA to synthesize more cholesterols. And uh, this is how it works. I don't know if I should go through each step. Uh, there's nothing really much you can say besides what is already written. Uh, however, I do want to make it easier for people to remember. First of all, thiolase. You're going to see this a lot with lipid synthesis. As soon as you see some sort of acetyl CoA, two, uh, two units of it, get transformed into one unit of something, it's almost always thiolase. It's also reversible right here. So either if it's we're we're uh, uh, we're breaking down the lipids or we're building the lipids again, you will always see thiolase if there are two acetyl CoA, whether they are on the product side or on the reactant side. So thiolase is going to be very, very important to remember for future uh, pathways as well. Uh, later on, we have the acetoacetyl-CoA, which you can pretty much recognize immediately because it looks like two acetyl-CoA being uh, mushed into one, except for the CoA being brought or one of them being brought out. Uh, late. Ooh, it's just flying away. <laughs> Later on, we have the HMG COA synthase. Now we're gonna see HMG with I think it's ketone body synthesis as well. Uh, and it's really important to remember this HMG. But anyways, this the synthase means that it's synthesizing, of course, the HMG or the hydroxy-3-methylglutaryl-CUA, um, which it's, is done through this uh, pathway. And also, if you, if you want to know where I got this image, 
It's in the homework task for week one. Next up is the HMGCOA reductase. So for synthase, you have to remember if we're synthesizing HMG, probably on the product side, we're going to see the HMG. Well, if we're reducing the HMG, we're going to see some sort of reduction occurring here um, for something at least. So here we're using NADPH and you're going to see NADPH for a lot of these lipid synthesis uh, pathways. This is extremely important for lipid synthesis. Um, so we're reducing it here. We're adding these two H's here into the molecule right here and we're creating mevalonate. Now mevalonate is, or one unit of mevalonate is equal to one unit of isopentyl pyrophosphate. Only in order to get from mevalonate to isopentyl pyrophosphate, you need to use uh, three units of ATP. So if you, this is going to be very important uh, when you, we calculate how, what, what is the cost uh, in ATP um, or ATP cost for uh, these lipid synthesis pathways. This is pretty much what we're dealing with in, in terms of cholesterols. So here we have a five carbon atom as well as with this, no, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, mevalonate has six, but isopentyl pyrophosphate has five. Why? That's because uh, this carbon dioxide gets out. So as soon as you see uh, three of these, um, uh, what do I call them, cofactors, three of these um, additional reactants going in and out of these pathways, you will know it's ATP for cholesterols. However, when something goes out of the pathway, uh, specifically out, it's either the carbon dioxide right here or it's this early uh, COA group that we have up here. But if it's later on, you will know it's the carbon uh, dioxide. Uh, there's some sort of a decarboxylation occurring here. And we are left with one uh, less carbon atom than before. For here, this is just a lot of memorization, guys. Uh, so we get into the condensation process right here. Uh, this is also some sort of a form of condensation. But with the condensation process, we need six in total of this isopentyl pyrophosphate in order to create one molecule of the squalene. Why? Because the squalene molecule requires 30 carbon atoms and there's five carbon atoms of isopentyl pyrophosphate. So if you take 30 divided by five, you will know that you need six of these in order to create one squalene molecule. Then later on, there it, uh, we have a cyclization process, which is just as the name suggests, we're cyc cyclizing, cyclizing, cyclizing <laughs> the squalene molecule into a lanisterol, which later turns into the final cholesterol molecule. <laughs> Yes, so we can then finally calculate if we know that we need six isopentyl pyrophosphate in order to create one squalene molecule, then we all uh, then we will also know how many acetyl COA we need. So if we look up here, this represents how much is needed in order to make one isopentyl pyrophosphate, and how many acetyl COA can we see then? We see two up here right at the beginning, that is react, uh, reacting with the thiolase enzyme. And then we also see one right here that is reacting with the HMGCOA synthase. So in total, it's two plus one, which is three acetyl-CoA that we need in order to make 
one isopentyl pyrophosphate. And we know this because one acetyl CoA equals two carbon atoms. This is something that you have to remember. So if we have three times two, that equals six. And for a mevalonate, it has six carbon atoms, and then it loses one during the decarboxylation right here. All right, so that explains why we have 18 acetyl CoA in order to make one cholesterol, because in order to make one uh, cholesterol, you also need six isopentyl pyrophosphate, uh, and six isopentyl pyrophosphate is equal to six mevalonates, and one mevalonate is equal to two plus one acetyl CoA which means that if we need six mevalonates to make one cholesterol, uh, we also need 18 acetyl CoA. So six times three, which is equal to 18, uh, which means that in order to make one cholesterol, we need a total of 18 acetyl CoA. And you can already imagine how much energy or potential energy in ATP that we are losing just from making one cholesterol. But we are not done yet because in order, oh, this is explaining even more. Wow. Skipping this completely. But uh, here we can see more in detail. This is the same as what we have up here. It's mevalonate that goes into isopentyl pyrophosphate right here. Uh, as you can see, here's isopent isopentyl pyrophosphate and here's the mevalonate. And here are all the ATPs that are going in. And then we can see the final decarboxylation occurring here as well. Uh, this is just more explaining. I'm going to also share this document with you guys so you can go through it a little bit easier. Uh, but not only are we calculating the acetyl COA, we're also thinking how many how much energy is expended from transporting the acetyl CoA? Because remember, this cholesterol synthesis occurs primarily in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which is, of course, in the cytosol. But our acetyl CoA, if you remember from, ooh, if you remember from uh, last colloquium, we have pyruvate, which is pyru py pyruvate, pyruvate which comes from glycolysis major majoritively. And it goes through the matrix of mitochondria, right? And then in the matrix of mitochondria, it's uh, going through this, the, oh God, I think it's called oxidative decarboxylation reaction. Oh, I hope that's right. I think it's right. It sounds right. In order to be made into acetyl CoA. And this occurs in the matrix of mitochondria. So how do we really get the acetyl CoA from the matrix of mitochondria in order to make the cholesterol in the cytosol? And this is the shuttle that will explain it. So we're using a citrate pyruvate shuttle. Usually it's a citrate malate shuttle, but it goes in a different direction here. Why? Well, that's because here, this malate to pyruvate conversion right here makes the NADPH plus H plus. And why is this so important? Well, that's because we need the NADPH uh, plus H plus <laughs> in order to make this mevalonate right here and also lots of other lipid synthesis pathways. So that's why it's making this huge uh, redirectional route uh, going into pyruvate and then go, going back into the matrix of mitochondria. This is the matrix, this is the cytosol. So here the acetyl CoA uh, binds together with the oxaloacetate and it forms the citrate which goes through a citrate transporter and here the citrate uh, converts back into oxaloacetate which then releases the acetyl CoA, which we can use for fatty acid synthesis, but of course also cholesterol synthesis. This pathway uh, 
is ATP dependent, which we can see right here and right here. You can also say, well, doesn't it also lose NADH plus H plus, which can be used for ATP? ATP? Both yes and no, uh, because here it gains it right back. So the net for the NADH plus H plus loss will be zero. But for the ATP right here, we will equate this to for every acetyl COA that is transported from the matrix, matrix of mitochondria into the cytosol for lipid synthesis, we are using a total of 1, 2 ATP. So that's why for every acetyl COA we have, we're using 2 ATP. And for cholesterols, oh, I forgot to mention, for cholesterols, they will always have exactly 27 uh, carbon atoms. You will not have a cholesterol that has 28 or 26 carbon atoms and you have to calculate how many acetyl COA fits in that uh, bracket. Instead, this is, uh, ooh, ooh, one calculation is enough to explain uh, all cholesterol synthesis. Uh, in total, it's going to be 54 ATP. Why? Because, of course, we calculated that one cholesterol uh, equates to 18 acid. Well, actually, we're getting to this later. But <laughs> one cholesterol is equal to 54 ATP uh, because 18 acetyl CoA is needed to make one cholesterol. So, uh, and if we need 18 acetyl COA, that means that we're getting rid of, uh, let me bring my calculator. This is what happens when I'm not prepared at all. Um, sorry, guys. Where was I? Yes. Uh, for 18 uh, acetyl COA, you will need a total of Oh, I hope I calculated that correctly. Let me just double check. Yes, 36 ADP uh, for 18 acetyl CoA. So in order to transport the acetyl CoA, we need 2 ATP per acetyl CoA, which we can see here, which would be 36 ATP for a cholesterol because a cholesterol always needs 18. That's just set. That's 36 ATP. And then the ATP used solely on reaction from mevalonate to isopentyl pyrophosphate, which we can see right here. The mevalonate is here. It's six carbon atoms. The isopentyl pyrophosphate is right here. It's five carbon atoms. And for every isopentyl pyrophosphate, we get rid of, ooh, we get rid of three ATP right here. That means that if we need six isopentyl pyrophosphate, we will need how many ATP? That's going to be three times six, which equals to 18. So the same amount of ATP uh, amount that is needed to convert every mevalonate needed for cholesterol into every isopentyl pyrophosphate is the same amount of acetyl COA we will need. Uh, so in this case, we will need 18 ATP for the mevalonate into isopentyl pyrophosphate convers conversion. And then we will also need uh, 36 ATP for the acetyl, uh, acetyl COA uh, transport from the matrix of mitochondria into the cytosol right here. And that will be a sum of, let me double check that I'm doing this correctly, a sum of 54 ATP. This is set. This is the exact sum that we need for one cholesterol, no matter what, all right? But then we get into something called the worth of a molecule. And what this means is, what if we used the acetyl COA that we uh, had to in order to make the lipid, in this case, the, the cholesterol, which we know is we need 18 acetyl CoA for one cholesterol. But what if we use it for citric acid cycle instead? And we know that in a citric acid cycle, we get 10 ATP in total. We get one from the GTP. We get three NADH plus H, which equals seven ATP. And then we get one, something's wrong here. 
this does not equate. It's supposed to be 7.5. Ha ha. Don't you love when math is just the best? Uh, all right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 3NADH plus H, which equals to 7.5 ATP. Uh, and then also 1FADH2, which equals to 1.5 ATP. This is all according to the electron transport chain, of course. And that is 10 ATP in total per acetyl -SUA. So how many ATP are we losing if we're using 18 acetyl -SUA in order to make one cholesterol molecule? Of course, if one acetyl -SUA is equal to 10 ATP, 18 acetyl -SUA will be equal to 180 ATP. So the total worth for this one cholesterol molecule is the amount of ATP that we're losing in order to create the isopentyl pyrophosphate as well as to transport the acetyl CoA and the worth of the acetyl CoA in and of themselves if they were instead used in the citric acid cycle. It's 234 ATP in total. This tells you how desperate we would be we would need to be in order to make or synthesize our own cholesterol in our body we would need to be able to lose 234 atp uh, or potentially 234 in order to make uh, our one single cholesterol molecule uh, gives you some thought, doesn't it? All right, next up is the beta oxidation. I wish I went through this with someone first before I filmed this, but let's start. Uh, let me just scroll down. All right, for beta oxidation, we have, uh, I think, two preparation phases in total, depending on uh, what we what kind of molecule we're looking at. First of all, we have a triacylglyceride breakdown in cells. Now, this is, of course, uh, facilitated by glucagon and epinephrine, two uh, hormones that, are, uh, that uh, stimulate the Ig protein, which stimulates the adenyl cyclase, increases CAMP production, and uh, activates this... Uh, enzyme called the protein kinase A. The protein kinase A helps with two things. First of all, it helps with the phosphorylate phosphor is that oh god phosphor phosphorylation there we go of perilipins. Now what are perilipins? Perilipins as you can see here in the purple kind of coat the lipid droplet. So where exactly do we need, do we get this tag that we're breaking down into these fatty acids? That's of course from the adipocytes or mostly from the adipocytes in the form of these lipid droplets. And these lipid droplets are protected by these perilipins, which are these protective coats, kind of uh, helping preserve the lipid until it's time for us to activate this uh, uh, secondary uh, messenger um, pathway and, and start breaking down the tags uh, for energy. So for protein kinase A, it sort of phosphorylates these perilipins, telling them to move out of the way so that we can actually get access to the lipid, lipid droplet and start breaking down the triacylglycerols. But that's only one of its functions. The second function uh, has to do with the hormone-sensitive lipase. And this lipase specifically breaks down uh, diacylglycerols. So if you remember, tags kind of have this weird shape. They have a glycerol backbone and then they have not one, not two, but three fatty acid tails. And these fatty acid tails have to be removed one by one. So for the first one, it's removed by this adipose triacylglycerol lipase, breaking down this. 
into diacylglycerols, which are uh, which has a glycerol backbone and two fatty acids. Now, this fatty acid goes into the blood system. Diacylglycerols are now broken down by the hormone-sensitive lipase, and these are activated by the protein kinase A. So not only does the protein kinase A in, is involved in this uh, chain reaction where it gets rid of the perilipins, uh, ac releases these CGI 58s, uh, which activates the adipose triacylglycerol lipase, which breaks down the, the tags, it also directly phosphorylates uh, these hormone-sensitive lipases in order for it to break down the, the continuation of this process, which is the DAGs. Now, the DAGs are broken down into monoacyl glycerol or MAX, uh, and the fatty acids from them are just moved into the blood system, but we'll get to that later. The monoacyl glycerols are now broken down by the monoacyl glycerol lipase, which is a very easy <laughs> enzyme to remember from its name. And finally, we are left with two products, which is the glycerol backbone, and we will get to this later, as well as the, the final fatty acid. Now, these fatty acids uh, that we have broken down from the tri triacylglycerols will now travel into the blood, but not by themselves. They have this sort of elevator uh, uh, process thing uh, with the help of something called the serum albumin. Now, the albumin transports the fatty acids out into the blood. It almost serves as this elevator function that helps the fatty acid to stay in place and uh, gets transported right through the blood system where it needs to go. Uh, okay, now we need to get into the glycerol metabolism because we can't just leave this glycerol hanging in this adipose uh, droplet. It needs to be broken down somehow. And that's where we get into this process right here. It's fairly easy. I'm not going to go into that much detail. But pretty much it involves one main uh, enzyme, which is glycerol kinase. It's also ATP dependent, but it gains back the ATP by reducing uh, the NAD plus uh, right here. And of course, this is equal to 2.5 ATP. So we're actually gaining ATP here instead of losing it. And from the glycerol, we're creating glycerol 3-phosphate. And we know that this is almost always facilitated by glycerol kinase. It's very easy to remember. Now, glycerol 3-phosphate can be made into dehydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP, by the glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. This is also a reversible process. Uh, finally, we can make this into a glycerol aldehyde 3-phosphate um, with the use of triasphosphate isomerase. Now, you might remember this from colloquium 2 because this did come up there, I believe. <laughs> and this will further go into either glycolysis, so we're going to continue to break down this into pyruvate, or gluconeogenesis, where we create uh, our glucose molecule or fructose molecule or whatever back. Uh, yeah, here's a little bit more information, but this pretty much tells you that we're not just leaving the glycerol here to hang um, while we're breaking down all the fatty acids. So we do need to break it, we need, do need to keep breaking it down. And Additionally, if it's broken down by this uh, glucagon activation, we are most probably going to see glycerol get uh, continue on into gluconeogenesis rather than glycolysis because, of course, glucagon also uh, facilitates for gluconeogenesis and kind of inhibits glycolysis. That gives you more of an idea uh, in order to get the bigger picture 
of this whole process. Now, next part is the preparation phase. Fatty acid transport into mitochondria from beta oxidation by fatty acyl transformation. This, and I cannot preface this enough, this is only if you have more than 12 carbon units. Why? Because less than 12 carbon units, they can easily go through the matrix of mitochondria. Maybe I shouldn't say easily, but they can definitely go through the matrix of mitochondria without having to rely on getting transformed into fatty, acyl, uh, into fatty acyls. Uh, however, for uh, fatty acid uh, chains that are longer than 12 carbons, they need to be transformed into fatty acids because this is the only way uh, that a, this transport shuttle system will be able to accept them and, and uh, make them go through the matrix of mitochondria uh, in order to continue, continue on with the beta oxidation. And this occurs with the help of ATP. So what we have here is we have this fatty acid. This, of course, has to be uh, over 12 carbon atoms, but right now it looks like this, kind of like a fidget spinner. And this in turn reacts with the ATP with the use of fatty acyl COA synthetase. This is very easy to remember this enzyme specifically because we are synthesizing the fatty, uh, fatty acyl COA and synthetase not synthase, but synthetase means that we're using ATP in order to make it to to make this end product. However, a, a thing that needs to be mentioned in this case is even though we're technically only using one ATP per fatty acid molecule, we are releasing two pyrophosphate, and this means that we're creating a. a AMP as a result. Now, this might be a little bit complicated. <laughs> I don't know exactly how I can explain this, but as soon as you see AMP instead of ADP, which is the the more I wouldn't say common, but you see this more often, I guess. Uh AMP is in need of an additional ATP in order to be converted back into ATP. Now, what exactly does that mean? Uh, because this only has one phosphate, we're in need of so much more energy in order to convert this back into this because this can't just continue on being a free little AMP in, in our body. This needs to be converted back into ATP. So as soon as you see something or AMP being produced from an ATP molecule, you have or you don't have to, but if you understand the fact that this stands for two ATP instead of one ATP, which is seen in the reaction, uh, and you can explain that somehow, uh, I think you will be all right. That's at least what our professor said, but. It, to be on the safe side, every time you see an AMP and you only see one ATP in the reaction, you have to remember for every AMP, it actually technically needs two ATP in order for it to be converted back into ATP. So for this whole reaction of one fatty acyl CoA, we not only need one ATP, we need two ATP in order to make this one fatty acyl CoA. So for every fatty acid that is longer than 12 carbon units, so this is not the case for 11 carbon units or 12 carbon units or anything below that. This is specifically for uh, 13 and up carbon units. They uh, are all going to have to go through this transformation, which costs 2 ADP in order to... Um, to transport this fatty acyl uh, COA into the matrix of, of mitochondria so it can go through the beta oxidation cycles. Now for the preparation phase number three. This is uh, the transport mechanism that we're having in order to transport the, 12, uh, the, the over 12 
uh, chain length carbon chain molecule. Wow, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> molecule from the cytosol into the matrix of mitochondria, and it's called the acylcarnitin slash carnitin transport. So carnitin goes out of the matrix of mitochondria. It brings this fatty acyl uh, COA with it, uh, creating this acylcarnitin uh, molecule right here. And this acylcarnitin goes from the cytosol into the matrix of mitochondria, finally freeing the uh, fatty acyl right here. And the carnitin goes back in and the cycle can continue. This is facilitated by three things. Number one is the carnityl acyl transferase one. Uh, now, if this stops working, carnitin or a uh, fatty acyl can't get in. While if uh, this acyl carnitin uh, slash carnitin transporter st stops working, carnitin can't get out of the matrix um, of mitochondria, but fatty acyl will be able to, to get in. Uh, additionally, we have this carnitin acyl transferase 2, which is actually a the enzyme. This is just the transport protein that helps facilitate the transport of acyl carnitin and carnitin through the matrix of mitochondria. It's also a rate limiting step, uh, which means it's the slowest process for fatty acid oxidation. Uh, and I do recommend memorizing this molecule, if you can. All right, beta-oxidation. It constitutes for four steps in total. Now, what does that exactly mean? In order to break two carbon atoms away from the, the fatty acid chain, we need to go through this whole process. So th just because you went through this whole process doesn't mean that you're, uh, you don't have a fatty acid chain anymore. By the end of this process, you just have two less fatty acids, which uh, produces one acetyl COA. Uh, we'll get into that later, but let's start with going through the steps of the, the beta oxidation. Now, easiest to remember is first it's dehydration, then it's hydration, then it's dehydration again, and then it's transfer of fatty acid chain and release of acetyl CoA. So let's start with the dehydration. In this case, dehydration uh, is a redox ox oxidation. That means that we're starting with uh, either an oxidative agent or a reducing agent. Well, actually, we're starting with both. Uh, and we're reducing and oxidizing something. So in this case, we're using this uh, coenzyme FAD, and we're reducing it into FADH2, which we want to see. The more energy, the better. And how do we know that? Well, that's because in uh, uh, electron transport chain, this constitutes for 1.5 ATP. Uh, in this case, how, how do we exactly know that this is what is going on? Uh, first of all, we're seeing a double bond occur right here. Second of all, when we're coming to something that is getting reduced and something that is getting oxidized, uh, as for this molecule right here, oxidized means that we're having either more O bonds, so oxygen bonds, but it can also mean that we're having less hydrogen bonds so right here we had two hydrogens here and two, two hydrogens here so two per uh, carbon atom here and here here now we only have one per carbon atom so they have been replaced by this double bond that has occurred right here so all this we do in order to create this double bond here and it's a pretty uh, lucrative exchange because we also get this FADH2 um, coenzyme, which we can use coenzyme? Cofactor, God, cofactor, <laughs> which we can use later for the electron transport chain. 
uh, and it's fairly easy to remember what enzyme this is facilitated by. And it's, of course, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Why? Because we're dealing with a fatty acyl-CoA right up here. It doesn't have to be palmitoyl CoA, but this is just an example because it's it has a total of 16 carbon atoms. But we have this fatty acyl um car uh, fatty acyl molecule right up here and it's getting dehydrogenated so it's losing these hydrogens uh, in order to, and giving it to this fad molecule right here uh, and in return we're creating this noil coa or in transform Step two involves hydration. Now, what does hydration mean? It means that we're, uh, we're inserting water and these uh, atoms that we're getting from the water uh, to hydrogen atoms as well as one oxygen uh, gets attached to this overall molecule. So we can see it right here. Uh, in this case, we have an additional hydrogen atom right here for this alpha uh, carbon. I think it's an alpha carbon. Yeah, look at me being smart. Uh, so one of these hydrogen atoms gets uh, introduced into this carbon atoms atom, and then the other hydrogen uh, atom as well as this oxygen atom gets introduced to this carbon atom, which is the beta carbon. Uh, because before we only had this one lonely uh, hydrogen bond right there and this is made by eno en wow enoil coa hydratase hydratase of course means that we're using water and introducing it into the molecule just like uh, synthetase meant that we're using atp and introdu introducing uh, phosphates into the molecule hydratase means that for water and if it's annual COA, it means that we're using annual COA and we're hydrolyzing it, not hydrolyzing, hydra, hydrating, hydrating it. That's it, hydrating the annual COA in order to make hydroxy or beta hydroxy acyl COA. Uh, all right, next up is the dehydration. Now, the dehydration is involves the same uh, principles as the first step which is that we're losing two hydration uh, hydration hydrogen bonds from this initial molecule so we're starting with this beta hydroxy acyl coa and it's losing uh this molecule as well as molecule this atom as well as this atom and instead we're creating more O bonds, as you can see here, oxygen bonds. Now we have two oxygen bonds here instead of the one, and we're also losing the hydrogen bonds right here. But again, it's pretty good because we're giving it to this cofactor right here and creating NADH plus H plus, which is equal to 2.5 ATP right here. So pretty lucrative as well. Uh, for this case, we have the same enzyme uh, uh, nomenclature uh, method as before. So for this, we have an acyl C, uh, as fatty acyl um, as our uh, reactant, and we are dehydrogenizing it. So it's an acyl CoA dehydrogenase. And right here, we have a beta hydroxy acyl CoA as our reactant and of course we're uh, dehydrating it so it's a dehydrogenase as well so i would say easiest to remember is uh, or the easiest way to remember this is to remember this intermediate and this intermediate and that way you will know immediately these enzyme names as well now this creates this keto acyl coa um, also a point hydroxy acyl means that there is a hydroxyl group and it's in an acyl uh, coa molecule 
For ketoacyl-CoA, there's a ketone group, and it's also in this acyl-CoA molecule. So if you remember that, you will be all right, kid. Okay, finally, we have the final step, which is the transfer of fatty acid chain and the release of acetyl-CoA. So the reactant will be this beta-ketoacyl-CoA, and we will have this acyl-CoA acetyl transferase, which uh, is actually the thiolase. So remember in the cholesterol uh, molecule synthesis that where we uh, f had this thiolase en enzyme, which involved this, uh, this uh, reaction of acetyl-CoA. The same principle is with this beta oxidation step. So we have an acetyl-CoA here, and this is actually many acetyl-CoA just merged into one. And because these contain pretty much just acetyl-CoA, we are dealing with a thiolase right here. And uh, also, as our reactant, we need a uh, CoA um, molecule right here to be introduced in order to make this acetyl-CoA. Uh, I think that's it for the beta oxidation explanation. Uh, so what I would recommend in this case is remembering this intermediate name, remembering this intermediate name and recognizing it is pretty easy because it's the one with the hydroxyl group, this intermediate name as well, uh, which you can also recognize by this ketone group, as well as, uh, well, actually, these this is the same as uh, what we had in the beginning, uh, only that we have two less carbon atoms. So both of these are actually acyl-CoA molecules, this one and this one. They just have two less carbon atoms because two of them are made into acetyl-CoA. Okay, now for the calculation of beta oxidation. Now, there are three types of beta oxidation methods that we're going to go through that correlate, correlates to three types of fatty acids. Number one is saturated. The second one is, is unsaturated. And the third one will be... Uh, uh, the third one will be... Uh, odd numbered saturated so this first one is saturated even numbered second will will be saturated odd numbered third one will be unsaturated even numbered now what does that even mean for saturated even numbered saturation means that there are uh, a no double bonds in this whole fatty acid chain of course with the exception of the carbox, uh, carboxylic acid group right here, uh, there are no other du double bonds here. This is a perfectly uniform fatty acid chain, uh, and it is the easiest uh, one to remember. It's also the, one, the most common one, I would say, in terms of just what is going to be popping up in our course. Uh, it involves what exactly? Well, First of all, we need to count the amount of beta oxidation rounds. Now, remember from this previous uh, slide that we have here, one beta oxidation round is equal to getting rid of two carbon atoms, which is equal to one acetyl CoA. All we're doing is we're splitting this molecule right here like this, and this little part right here becomes the acetyl CoA. Actually, we're splitting it here, <laughs> not there, uh, because we need the two carbon atoms right there. So for every beta oxidation round, we're creating one acetyl CoA out of the out of two carbon atoms in the fatty acid molecule. This means that for every two carbon atoms we have one uh, round of beta oxidation round, except for 
the last round. And I will explain why. Imagine beta oxidation as a pair of scissors like this, right? So this is the beta oxidation. And it cuts through these uh, fatty acids two carbons at a time. So it cuts through this, creating an acetyl CoA, and then the rest of the, of the fatty acid right here. And then it cuts through uh, this molecule, two of the carbon atoms right here, like this, creating another, uh, another acetyl CoA, and then the rest of the molecule right here. Now for the final round, when we're left with one, two, three, four carbon atoms, we only really need one round of beta oxidation in order to make two acetyl CoA. That is why you're taking the number of carbon atoms divided by two minus one, because the final round, we only need one snip right here in order to make one and two acetyl CoA. So if it's easier for you to remember, if you're faced with a task, we say that there's, uh, we have uh, this molecule right in front of us. I would say the best thing to do is to uh, draw up every second carbon atom, like, just like I did right here. And it's nine, acid, uh, nine, nine pairs of carbon atoms in total. And then you calculate how many times you need to snip this molecule in order to free all of these uh, pairs of carbon atoms. In our case, it would be one right here, 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 and then continuing on into the last one. And if we calculate all of this, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in total snips. That is equal to the amount of uh, of uh, beta oxidation rounds that we need in order to break down this whole fatty acid molecule. Uh, but we can also just use the formula. So if we have 18 carbon atoms in total, we divide it by 2, which would give us 9. But if we take 9 minus 1, because the last beta oxidation round produces 2 2 acetyl CoA, it would give us eight. It's the same amount as we did just now when we uh, did the uh, snipping um, method, right? It also gave us eight rounds. But I do recommend drawing it up because it's there's going to be a lot of different formulas and it's going to be a little bit easier uh, having facing the molecule and knowing what you're doing instead of just memorizing the formulas, right? Next up is calculating the number of ATP generated from each beta oxidation cycle, right? Only from the beta oxidation cycles. And if we remember from the beta oxidation rundown, we create uh, one FADH2 right here as well as one NADH plus H right here. And that is equal to four ATP. Why? Because one FADH2 is equal to 1.5 ATP and one NADH plus H plus is equal to 2.5 ATP. And these together, 1.5 plus 2.5 equals four. And that's why for every beta oxidation round that we're doing, as every single one of these, every single one of the SNPs that we're doing, we're gaining four ATP in total just from the beta oxidation cycles only. So if we if we did this snipping method or if we use the formula, no matter which whichever you choose. You only need to take the number of beta oxidation rounds and multiply it by four in order to get the number of ATP generated from the beta oxidation cycles. Now we're ca counting the number of acetyl CoA. And for saturated, even numbered fatty acids, it's pretty easy. You just take the number of carbon atoms and divide it by two. Why? Because for every pair of uh, carbon atoms, so for every two carbon atoms, 
we have one acetyl serine. So this represents one, this represents another one, and another one, and another one, etc. We can also see it here, represented here. Uh, one, two, this is broken into one acetyl serine, and that would be one, two carbon atoms. And it continues here with another pair, and here with these two pairs. That's why for every number, uh, for every two carbon atoms we have, we get one acetyl CoA. So in this case, if we go from this example, this one has 18 carbon atoms, that would be nine acetyl CoA in total. Uh, all right, now, from the acetyl CoA, if we remember from the citric acid cycle right here, one acetyl CoA will generate us uh, one FADH2 right here, three NADH plus H, this one, this one, and this one, as well as one GTP, which is equal to one ATP right here. And that is just from one acetyl CoA. So we can calculate the number of ATP generated from citric acid cycles only if we use the acetyl CA in citric acid. It doesn't mean that we are using uh, the acetyl CoA we, we get from the beta oxidation into the citric acid cycle. This is just uh, theoretically what the products are worth in, in ATP molecules, right? And that would be the number of acetyl CoA formed from the fatty acid uh, beta oxidation rounds times 10. And we get the number of acetyl CoA from this formula right here because it's every second pair. And it's times 10 because for every acetyl CoA, we gain 10 ATP just from the cofactors, which we can see right here. And that would be a lot of ATP. So in our case, for up here, if we have nine pairs in total, that would be nine acetyl CoA times 10, which would be equal to 90 ATP generated just from the acetyl CoA we, we gain. And that is not even including the beta oxidation cycles, right? Now we calculate the number of ATP generated from full oxidation of fatty acid, which would be uh, the two previous ones that we, we just did. So the number of ATP generated from the beta oxidation cycles, which is uh, from here. So this one and this one right there, as well as the number of ATP generated from citric acid cycle using the acetyl CoA that we get from the beta oxidation cycles, right? Uh, and for us, in our case, it would be um, uh, if we got, uh, let me think, uh, if we have eight beta oxidation uh, cycles, which we get from this formula, formula, we will have a total of eight times four. Uh, let me actually write it down, it would be easier for people to understand eight times four why because we do eight snippets right here one two three four five six seven eight right so that would be eight beta oxidation rounds we can also take 18 divided by two minus one to get the exact same number uh, and of course times four because that's what we get from each beta oxidation and uh, oxidation cycle and that will be equal to 24 atp in total just from the beta oxidation cycles only. And now we can also calculate the number of ATP generated from the citric acid cycle, theoretically, and that would be each acetyl CoA. And we can calculate that by taking the number of carbon atoms divided by two, because for every two carbon atoms, we get one acetyl CoA, right? So if we have 18 carbon atoms, uh, that would be a total of nine acetyl CoA. And 9 times 10 ATP, which we gain from uh, each citric acid uh, cycle round, is equal to 90 ATP. Now we can take this plus this 
to see uh, to calculate the number of ATP we would gain from full oxidation of a fatty acid. Remember this specific word, full oxidation. And this is only in terms of the saturated even numbered fatty acids. And that would be 90 plus 24, which is of course equal to 114 ATP in total. Because it would be number of ATP from beta oxidation rounds plus number of ATP from citric acid cycle. However, and this is only in case of fatty acid chains, which are longer than 12C. Remember that if we have a fatty acid chain that is longer than 12C, we need to use the acylcarnitin slash carnitin transport in order to transport the fatty acid from the cytosol into the matrix of mitochondria. And in order to do that, they have to be transformed into this fatty acyl a molecule and to do ooh, and to do the transformation we need to use one ATP uh, but this ATP is turned into AMP which means that we technically use two ATP per fatty acid molecule that we transport from the cytosol into the matrix of mitochondria so for each fatty acid oxidation if it's bigger than 12 carbon atoms, we will lose 2 ATP just from the transport of the fatty acid from the cytosol into the matrix of mitochondria because beta oxidation can only happen in the matrix of mitochondria. So if we have a carbon atom that is bigger than 12 or carbon atom, if you have a, a fatty acid uh, molecule that is bigger than 12 carbon atoms, we have to subtract 2 ATP from this uh, overall uh, ATP full oxidation calculation due to the transport of fatty acid into the matrix of mitochondria. Next up, we come to the saturated odd-numbered fatty acids. Now, what are saturated odd-numbered fatty acids? That only means that we have an odd number of uh, coal, uh, coal atoms in our fatty acid. So instead of what we had up here, which was 18, uh, here we would have a total of 9 carbon atoms. And what is special with this is that we cannot just... Uh, form uh, an even or a a we can we can't oh god how do I, not every carbon atom will be able to be utilized in order to form the acetyl coa because if we uh divide these by pairs just like we did up here right just like we did here we will have one carbon atom that is left out right here. And this, we can't just have a random carbon atom floating around. So that's why uh, in, in biochemistry, uh, we are creating a, another rest molecule. In this case, it would be the propionyl CoA. So what are we, what is gonna happen that's gonna be different from the previous, um, method when we had saturated even numbered fatty acids here everything is normal we have a normal beta oxidation cycle so remember that for each two carbon atoms we're snipping off uh, the the fatty acid molecule by beta oxidation rounds so this would be one acetyl coa and then this will be further uh, going through a beta oxidation round like so, but as soon as we get to five carbon atoms right here, not three, but five specifically, we get to the final round of beta oxidation for, for uneven numbered fatty acids. For, uh, for um, saturated even numbered fatty acids, we, the final uh, round had four carbon atoms, but because we have an uh, odd number here, the final round will constitute five carbon atoms right here. 
Now, the first product will be no the normal acetyl COA right here. But the second product will have three carbon atoms in total, and it will create this propionyl COA. Now, this is important to remember, and also, I don't know if this is going to come up, but if you see this molecule, you will immediately know it's propionyl COA. Uh, so in this case, instead of uh, getting rid of one, uh, oh, sorry, get, instead of getting rid of one uh, round of beta oxidation, because technically you get two by the final round, right? Just as you did here. You're getting rid of 1.5. Why? Because the final three carbon atoms are going to be turned into this propionyl COA. Um, and that's why you get rid of one beta oxidation round, which would normally uh, take this and this and turn it into acetyl COA. And then 0.5, which constitutes this last car carbon atom. But again, if you want to be very, very sure and you don't want to memorize lots of formulas, just write up the fatty acid molecule. Write, write it up and then for the final five molecules, uh, that would be your last, oh, here, that would be your last beta oxidation round. So uh, in our case, uh, these would be our final five molecules. So this would be, oh, am I doing it right? No, sorry. This would be a final five. This would be our last bed oxidation round. And then we can go to uh, uh, two for one pair each. So here would be another bed oxidation round and here would be another round. So in total, this would be three rounds, right? Uh, so, and that we can calculate also using this formula. So number of carbon atoms, in our case, it's nine divided by two, which equals to 4.5. And then 4.5 minus 1.5, right, equals to three, just like we did here. Only here, we are super duper safe because we know for sure we're doing it right. And now we count the number of acetyl CoA. And uh, before, it was actually just taking uh, the number of carbon atoms and dividing it by, by two, which was different from, from calculating the number of bed oxidation rounds. But because the last five, uh, f oh God, the last five, the last three carbon atoms becomes a propionyl CoA, uh, we will have to do exactly the same thing we did with the number of beta oxidation rounds. Uh, and we can see this uh, right here because these three are not gonna become acetyl CoA. But we know that these two will, these two will, and these two will. That is the same amount of beta oxidation round. We have one, two, three. Uh, so this will not become acetyl CoA, but these will. So it's the same. Uh, principle and the same formula we're using here as we are using here. Now the number of ATP generated from beta oxidation cycles only is of course the number of beta oxidation cycles times four. Why? Because per beta oxidation cycle we get one FADH2 as well as one NADH plus H plus, right? Uh... Yeah, I'm thinking of actually making two parters of this because we are kind of going overboard. But yeah, let's make this a two parter. Let's end it with the unsaturated even numbered. Or maybe let's end it with ketogenesis. Uh okay. So we would yeah, we would count the number of acetyl COA or count the number of beta oxidation rounds and multiply it by four in order to get the number of ATP generated just from the beta oxidation cycles only. Finally, we will calculate the number of ATP generated from full oxidation. And I didn't go into detail here, but the number of ATP uh, generated from citric acid cycle is, of course, just like we did up here, number of acetyl COA from fatty acid times 10. 
and we know that the number of fatty acids uh, fatty as number of acids acetyl coa god acetyl coa would be the same as this formula in this case it would be one two three because the final three three will be made into propionyl coa uh, and that is equal to three times 10 which is equal to 30 for this molecule right here now we take 30 and then we uh, actually let me write it down again 30 atp from citric acid cycle uh, and then we have a uh, number of atp from beta oxidation rounds and it's the same principle as it was here only we take times 4 instead of times 30. Wait, here is time, 3 times 10, just to see. Here would be 3 times 4 because we get 4 ATP per, uh, per beta oxidation cycle. So this would be equal to 12 ATP. And then we have something special. Remember that we created the propionyl COA. Now, you may think this is just a rest product in order to make this beta oxidation cycle happen because we can't just be left with one uh, carbon atom, right? Wrong. Actually, the propionyl CoA is later converted into something that we should all remember, which is succinyl CoA, used in the citric acid cycle in order to make ATP, right? And we can see that right here. The propionyl uh, is decarboxylated by, of course, our favorite uh, vitamin, which is vitamin B7, biotin, using ATP. So it is ATP dependent. We're, we're not only gaining ATP, we're also using it right here. And this is... Uh, created into its final product which is succinyl coa and if we go into the citric acid cycle we can see that the succinyl coa is right here so we're only gaining this gtp this fadh2 and this nadh plus h plus we're not gaining this one nor this one because we're starting the citric acid cycle from this point with the succinyl coa and this whole process is equal to 1 GTP, which is 1 ATP. Uh, sorry, 1 ATP right here. And then 1 FADH2, which is equal to 1.5 ATP. And then 1 NADH plus H, which is equal to 2.5 ATP. So in total, this is equal to to 5 ATP from one 6 nil coa It's the same principle as having just one acetyl COA, only this time we only get one 6 nil COA because we only get, get, we only get one final propionyl COA from the odd numbered fatty acid that are, is later generated into the 6 nil COA. And that will gain us 5 ATP. Now, why are we losing one ATP here? Because in order to make the pro, uh, make the succinyl COA from the propionyl COA, we need to use ATP. So we're also losing one ATP. So technically, the propionyl doesn't uh, gain us five ATP in net. It actually gain us four ATP because it's losing one ATP in order to be converted into the succinyl COA. Now, what are we dealing with here? Remember, if the fatty acid is bigger than 12 carbons, we also lose 2 ATP. Why? Uh, just a reminder, in order to transport the fatty acid that is longer than 12 carbons, we need to use the acylcarnitine carnitine transport, and it can only accept acyl, uh, fatty acyls, not fatty acids, but fatty acyls with this COA group. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to use ATP, which is converted into AMP, which is technically 2 ATP. So in our case right now, uh, if it's, if it's uh, a fatty acid that is bigger than 12 carbons, in order to transport it into the matrix of mitochondria, we will lose 2 ATP. 
but if you guys remember from my example here, it's a total of nine carbon atoms. So in our case, for this molecule specifically, it would only uh, it would not lose two ATP because it will not be need, it will not be needing the uh, carnitin slash acyl carnitin transport in order to get into the matrix of mitochondria. This can actually go through the matrix of mitochondria by itself. So in our case right here, we would not uh, need to calculate this. So with for our final formula right here, we would actually gain plus 4 ATP, not plus 2, because what I did here is I just took the sum of this. So 5 minus 1 minus 2, that's 5 minus 3, which is equal to 2. But if the molecule is uh, not bigger than 12 carbon atoms, we actually have a plus 4 here, not plus 2. Now here we get into the unsaturated, even-numbered fatty acids. Uh, in this case, we are dealing with the number of beta-oxidation rounds. Well, actually, let me talk about what uh, what we're even, even meaning with unsaturated, just to uh, get up to speed. So let's say we have this fatty acid, which looks gorgeous, right? Just like a mountainous landscape. And uh, yeah, we also have to... How do you even draw it? There we go. Did I do it right? Am I sleepy? Okay, yeah, I did it right. Thank God. Okay, I am sleepy. I don't know why I asked that question. Uh, this is actually the first carbon. Two, three, four, five. Whoop. Six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. For unsaturated fatty acids, they always have, and I hope that I'm mentioning this correctly, but I believe this is a trans, yeah, this, no, yes, this is a trans double bond. Oh God, I hope it's a trans double bond and I'm not making a mistake here. Sorry, it's late. <laughs> Anyways, this is a trans double bond for the unsaturated even numbered fatty acid, right? Thank God it's even numbered. Uh, in our case, we need to remake this trans fatty acid into a cis fatty acid. So we're pretty much remaking it in so that it is all uniform and ready to be uh fully oxidated by beta oxidation cycles right and in order to do that we're actually losing atp why well let's go in here hopefully i explain it i don't <laughs> uh, actually here i kind of explain it so here we have our uh, unsaturated fatty acid which, which with a cis uh, double bond right here uh, yeah, and we are actually uh, going through normal beta oxidation cycles up until we get to the carbon atom that uh, is adjacent to this double bond. And in order to fix this double bond, we're using two molecule, uh, two enzymes in total, both NaOCOA isomerase, because what we're dealing with right now is an NaOCOA. And that is because we have a double bond. Uh, so isomerase, of course, means that it's we have the same amount of atoms. We're just changing uh, the structure of the molecule, but we're not changing the, the content of the molecule, right? And then we're also dealing with uh, oh my god. DNOEL COA reductase in case we have polyunsaturated fatty acids. And polyunsaturated fatty acids only means something like that we have something like this. So we have several uh, unsaturated um, 
uh, areas, this one and this one. But right now, let's just talk about the one NOL COA isomerase. Now, this isomerase turns this uh, fatty acid molecule into just a normal NOL. Uh, I think it's a trans NOL COA. Sorry, my cat. I just realized that I made the mistake that this is actually a cis bond and not a trans bond. Let me double check. Also, excuse me, my cat is making a lot of noise right now. Trans bond. My Google search is trans bond girl, which is not exactly what I'm looking for. Chemistry. There we go. Um, oh God. Yeah, I admit this. Mistake. So this is a cis bond, not a trans bond. Okay. The one that looks like a boat is this. The one that has the, um, the one that looks like this is trans. Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. So this is the trans bond and we are creating the uh, we are creating the trans bond from this cis bond right here. Uh, but because we now have this annual cis uh, uh, NS or trans and God trans annual COA molecule right here that we created from this cis annual COA molecule, we are skipping the first step of our beta oxidation cycle the dehydration step why because remember for uh for our first step we are creating this double bond with uh by uh, by a redox reaction we're getting rid of two hydrogen atoms and creating this double bond here which is a trans double bond and uh when we do this, we're also creating this uh, cofactor. Am I saying it wrong? Is it cofactor? I think so. We're also creating this cofactor right here, which is the FADH2 molecule. And this gives us, of course, 1.5 ATP. But since we already did that with the use of an isomerase instead of a dehydrogenase, we're not going to be able to create this FADH2 molecule anymore. We already have this, this one. So why do we need to go through this process again, right? And that's why we are going to be losing uh, 1.5 ATP in our final beta oxidation cycle ATP calculation. Why? Because we're skipping this first dehydration part. Not for the entire molecule, but for but when we get to this uh, cis bond right here, we're not going through this dehydration because the NOL isomerase is turning it into a trans bond, which is exactly what we're doing here, only we're not utilizing this uh, redox reaction anymore. So that's why we're losing the 1.5 ATP in, in terms of uh, FADH2 when we're calculating for the final ATP yield just from the beta oxidation cycles only. For the number of acetyl CoA, it's the same as we did for the even numbered fatty acids, same as with calculating the citric acid uh, cycle yield. It's just number of acetyl CoA times 10. And then finally, we get to this, which is just the number of ATP gained from beta oxidation round plus number of eight, wow, number of ATP gained from the citric acid cycle minus two as long as, as we're dealing with, with a uh, fatty acid, which is longer than 12 carbon atoms. We can take the example of this molecule right here. So this molecule has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon atoms in total. So if we calculate the number of beta oxidation rounds right here, that would be eight divided by two, which equals to uh, six. 
and then 6 minus 1, which is equal to 5. But we can also know that just by calculating the number of beta oxidation rounds by doing the SNP, SNP method. So we're snipping here, here, which is 2, and then here, this will count as 1 because this is going to be turned into the, the trans uh, version. And then uh, we don't need to snip here because this will turn into one acetyl CoA and this will turn into another. So in total, uh, it's going to be 3, 1, 2, 3, right? Just as we calculated, oops, just as we calculated, ignore that. <laughs> Just as we calculated up here, right? Uh, <laughs> God damn it. Okay. Uh, yes. And then we can calculate the number of ATP gained from this beta oxidation rounds, which would be number of beta oxidation round times 4, which is equal to 12. Uh, but we lose one FADH2 uh, molecule because we have this uh, cis bond that we want to turn into a trans bond where we losing the opportunity to use this redox reaction. So that's going to be 12 minus 1.5. And that is equal to 10.5 ATP just from the amount of beta oxidation cycles. Then we can calculate the number we gain from citric acid cycle, which is just the number of acetyl COA we gain. COA times 10, of course, because it's one citric acid cycle, and that is equal to, oh, the number here would be 8 divided by 4, which is 4 for once, uh, so 4 times 10, and that is equal to 40. So we take 40 plus 10.5, and that is our full oxidation calculation for our unsaturated, even numbered fatty acid. For ketogenesis, this is completely different from what we're, what we're doing with the lipid synthesis, but for ketogenesis, genesis, God, I got so Swedish there for a second. Ketogenesis uh, is something that is occurring in the mitochondria of liver cells specifically why well uh it's mostly when we're not having a lot of carbohydrate supply in our body so usually when we're in ketosis uh, or when we're dealing with pathologies such as diabetes where insulin is not working so if insulin is not working that means that we can't take up the glucose that we eat uh, which means that we have to gain our energy in another way. And that is where we get ketogenesis, right? So ketogenesis occurs when oxaloacetate is depleted. Uh, and oxaloacetate is, of course, needed for citric acid cycle entry uh, of acetyl CoA. So if acetyl CoA cannot get into citric acid cycle because we don't have any uh, oxaloacetate, we will have an accumulation of, of acetyl COA, which will be made into ketone bodies. And the three ketone bodies we will be talking about is acetone, which is the least utilized one, acetoacetate, which is the a little bit more utilized, but the most utilized is going to be the beta hydroxybutyrate. So these three are water soluble, so they will be able to be transported via blood very easily. So for the keto, ketone body uh, uh, creation, this is how it looks like. And of course, we have our favorite enzyme, thiolase. As soon as we are working with a uh, bundle of acetyl CoA, we're always having this enzyme uh, with us, thiolase. Uh, and we're creating then acetoacetyl CoA you can recognize these two first steps by the cholesterol synthesis that we did uh, previously right here. 
thiolase first uh, and two acetyl CoA as our reactants, which creates acetyl acetyl CoA right here. And then we have the HMG CoA synth synthetase, which uh, creates this HMG molecule right here. But instead of reductase for uh, our ketone body um, synthesis, we actually have lyase right here. So up here, we have thiolase, we have synthase. Uh, one second, is it synthetase up here or synthase up here? Oh, it's also synthase. Okay, my bad. Uh, so these two are the exact same steps as we do in the cholest cholesterol synthesis. But when we get here, where we're taking the HMG uh, molecule, uh, we're actually breaking it down. Instead of converting this into mevalonate, oh God, I hope it's mevalonate, right? I'm not... Ah, oh, look at me. Yes, instead of creating the HMG into mevalonate, we're actually breaking it down uh, with the use of a ely lyase uh, enzyme or the HMG CoA lyase. And what does lyase enzymes do? Well, they break down a molecule and they replace uh, the, the product uh, with a new double bond. So in our case, Right here, we're, uh, we have broken, I think we've broken this part of the molecule, which makes sense because it's an acetyl CoA. And this gets rid of this molecule's uh, inability to be water soluble. Now it is perfectly water soluble. And finally, we're creating this molecule, which is an acetyl acetate. And because it's a lyase, we're adding a double bond because we broke out a, a uh, part of this, this original reactant, right? The acetyl uh, acetate, again, like I said, we don't really use it as much as we use the beta hydroxy butyrate. So in our case, we're actually converting the acetyl acetate into beta hydroxy butyrate which is made with the use of this enzyme which is the beta hydroxy butyrate dehydrogenase and yes we're using atp in order to do that however the gain will be a lot better than the loss in this case of course we can also make ac acetone uh, by the use of acetyl acetoacetate decarboxylase where we're losing a, a carbon atom However, we don't really like this that much. <laughs> okay, for the ketone body utilization, this is, to, to specify, this is not the reverse of this synthesis. Even though you can recognize the thiolase again, which is our favorite enzyme, this will not be the reverse reaction of this. Um, yeah. Sorry, just making sure that I haven't mentioned something that I haven't mentioned. Wow. Uh, so for the ketone body utilization, we start off with the beta hydroxy butyrate. Again, this is the most common one. And see here, we're actually gaining back this cofactor right here, the NADH plus H plus that we're losing when we're creating the beta hydroxy butyrate. When we're utilizing it, we're actually gaining it back. Uh, so uh, technically, we're at a net loss of zero, right? Uh, and of course, because it's a redox reaction, we can use the same enzyme that we used before, which is the beta hydroxy butyrate dehydrogenase. In our case, we're creating the acetoacetate, just like we are right here. And the acetoacetate can uh, can uh, be um, can get into a reaction with succinyl CoA as another reactant in order to make succinate, but also this acetoacetyl CoA, just like we we did here. But remember, this is not a reverse reaction. 
and this is made with the help of this enzyme, which is the beta ketoacyl CoA transferase. I do recommend you remembering the structures of these molecules. Of course, you will remember the acetyl CoA and the acetyl acetyl CoA and the H HMG. So it's only these three that are going to be new for you. If you remember the cholesterol synthesis molecules as well. Uh, now we have our favorite enzyme, which is the thiolase, and this creates our 2-acetyl-CoA. So not only are we gaining the 2-acetyl-CoA that we uh, started with before, uh, we're actually also um, equalizing the loss of the NADH plus H plus that we have here. Only now, uh, the acetyl-CoA was able to be water soluble by being created into ketone bodies and this can go into uh, tissues that are in dire need of energy when we don't have glucose that we can rely on anymore or carbs that we can rely on for energy synthesis. So in our case, we're creating the 2-acetyl-CoA again when we're utilizing the ketone bodies. This can be in the brain, this can be in the heart, and we're creating succinate. Now remember, it's not succinyl-CoA, so we're not starting here, but we're actually starting here. So we're gaining a 1-FADH2+, 1-NADH plus H plus H, plus 1-NADH plus H plus, uh, and that's it. So it's going to be four ATP in total if you if you just do the math real quick. Uh, and then also the two acetyl CoA that you can just feed into the citric acid cycle to get two rounds of uh, citric acid cycles in total 20 ATP plus the four ATP that we get from the succinate, which is equal to 24 ATP. So this is a pretty good energy uh, compensator when we don't have any glucose to rely on anymore. We can just use the ketone bodies or use the, uh, the acetyl-CoA that we had in the beginning that can't, remember, we can't feed it into the citric acid cycle anymore because uh, the oxaloacetate is depleted in our liver cells. Uh, and that means that we instead we say, okay, let's say that this is our liver and in here we have most of our citric acid activity uh, and then all of a sudden we don't have any uh, oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate and this works as pretty much as a key in order to, to make the ATP that we need to make for the acetyl-CoA to get fed into the citric acid cycle. So the liver panics, and well, not panics, it's actually smarter than that. It uh, sees these additional acetyl CoA that it has that it cannot use to feed into its own citric acid cycle uh, system. And instead, it transforms them into these ketone bodies that are easily water soluble because the acetyl CoA are not water soluble. These are, so they can be transported via blood very easily just from this reaction. And then finally, when they get to the brain, let's say, uh, oh, this is gonna be a beautiful brain. You guys have never seen a more beautiful brain than this. Look at that. That's a stunning brain. Uh, and uh, in the brain, we get these ketone bodies, right? And it's quickly utilized in order to make its uh, the 2-acetyl-CoA again and then feed it into the citric acid cycle. This is in a perfect system because technically, if you haven't noticed, we're actually using 3-acetyl-CoA. Remember, this is equal to uh, not two, but three acetyl CoA in total. So we're actually losing an acetyl CoA in the process. But this is for when the liver can't synthesize uh, ATP from from the citric acid cycle. Usually, when oxaloacetate uh, is depleted in the in the liver, and then what it does, it's it's sending the acetyl CoA 
uh, as a packaged form, which would be these ketone bodies, back into uh, uh, organs and tissues that are in need of energy, which would be the brain, for example, in this case, in order for it to synthesize it back into acetyl-CoA so that it can be used for the citric acid cycle, right? Now, when exactly are we depleted from this oxaloacetate? When does that happen? Well, if we go back up here, it could happen with pathologies such as diabetes where insulin is not working. So what happens when insulin is not working? Of course, we can't get glucose into our bodies anymore. Glucose will be stuck in our intestines uh, or it, it won't be able to be broken down into acetyl CUA, right? So what happens instead? The body starts to sort of, uh, not panic, but it kind of wants to compensate for the lack of ATP that we would usually gain from oxidation of this carbohydrate. So that way, uh, instead of how do you say, instead of uh, um, going through and just having random acetyl CoA around, which, you know, is not only made from glucose, but it can also be made from uh, lipid, uh, lipid breakdown from better oxidations, right? It's packaged into ketone bodies and then sent into tissues that can actually use the acetyl CoA. However, the oxaloacetate uh, can be depleted when we have a low carbohydrate intake. Why? Because we're using the oxaloacetate to make glucose via gluconeogenesis. If you remember, oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate can be made into glucose. And if we're doing this, we don't really have enough oxaloacetate to feed into this citric acid cycle. So our key for the citric acid cycle is depleted. And that's why we will have a very, very, very big uh, accumulation of acetyl CoA. So the liver says, hey, let me just package this. And even though I'm losing approximately 33% uh, of the acetyl I have, at least it will be able to be, the other 66% will be able to be used in, in brains or hearts uh, just as the form of ketone bodies. And that is sort of how this process functions. Thinking in the next video, I'm going to go through the lipid synthesis instead of making a very, very huge video. I um, hope you guys enjoy this. I hope it didn't make too little sense. Um, and yeah, see you soon.